Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, we are talking about fruit trees. Becky Carroll shares with us about frost pockets, chilling hours, and how to heal them in until planting. Then we head over to Greenleaf Nursery to see all the work that goes into their container peach trees. we think of the Oklahoma landscape as being flat, but actually there is some slight elevation that can play a critical role in your backyard fruit trees. Today joining us is Becky Carroll, the OSU Extension Specialist. So Becky, let's talk a little bit about these frost pockets that we can find in our landscape. Yeah, cold air is a lot like water. It's gonna flow downhill and collect. Uh -huh. So these low spots like right here, this is gonna be maybe a couple of degrees colder than even up where we were starting. And so it, it really makes a big difference on the location that you plant your trees. So why do you not want fruit trees in frost pockets? Obviously, because it can do some damage, but yeah. let's talk about the mechanics of it a little bit. So, you know, most of our fruit trees are gonna be blooming early spring. And with Oklahoma's weather, we never know when we're gonna get that last spring freeze. Mm -hmm. And so if we can keep those trees a little bit warmer, we'll have a better chance to have a fruit crop. Okay. And so even a degree or two can make the di difference between having fruit and not. And so we saw it last year, a lot of areas where those low spots, that late April freeze that we had last year, mm -hmm. those low spots had trees with no fruit in the bottom part even. And so it can make a difference just in that tree uh, space. So maybe the top part of your tree has fruit and the bottom doesn't. So it can make a big difference in just little things. So we're out here at the Cimarron Research Station and there is a bit of, a, it's flat, but there's a bit of elevation from the north side all the way down to the south with pecans behind us. Tell us a little bit about how y'all have laid out your planting to deal with that elevation. So peaches are one of the earliest blooming. So they usually bloom the middle of March. That's, you can just about put your clock on March 15th to the 20th in, in this middle part of the state. And so they're blooming before pecans and apples and pears usually. So we want them on the best location, the best site. And here on the station, that would be right up on top of this hill. And so it had the most elevation, really good soil. So when we get cold air, it settles down that hill, flows all the way down to the bottom. And last year we had some of those trees in the very bottom part of the, the pecan trees had some freeze damage and the ones up a little bit higher didn't have any problems. And so it's uh, it can be a big, uh, problem if you're in that one of those low areas. And it doesn't have to be a big slot, a slope like this. It can just be a little bit of a dip in, a, in an area can cause a big uh, issue as well. All right, so I'm uh, talking about elevation. Is there a particular side that we should be looking at too on the slope or? Um, you, you probably, if you have a choice, mm -hmm. an eastern facing slope is gonna be better than north or south, uh, just because it's gonna warm up a little bit slower and it's not gonna be as cold if it's on the northern slope. Uh, the south facing slope is gonna get more sun, more warmth, and so those buds may push and, and come out a little bit quicker. So eastern slope, a little bit better, but I would really look at elevation first. All right, Becky, thanks again for giving us a new perspective on how to look at our landscape. I've been getting a few calls already about uh, bloom this year on fruit trees and on some of our small fruit plants. Uh, we've got really erratic 
bloom. We've got some blooms that are, are uh, past, even at shuck split, and then some that are just now blooming and some that are still thinking about pushing out into a bloom. And this may have to do with the amount of chilling hours that we received this past winter. And Casey and I talked a little bit about this in a February segment, but just to recap, a chilling hour is the time, is the hours that we have between 34 and 45 degrees after the trees become dormant in the, in the fall. And so we're, we count up the number of hours that are in between those critical temperatures, 34 to 45 degrees. And so normally if we look at the average chilling hours for Oklahoma, from down in the southeast part of the state, we may have 800 hours, maybe up to 1,000. And as you go further north, then we have, we go maybe up to 12 or 1,400 hours on average. And so most of the trees that we're going to recommend that you grow are within that chilling hour range. So for a lot of our peaches, they may range anywhere from maybe uh, 700 to 950 or even over a thousand hours of chilling that is needed. But why do we need chilling hours? That's probably a good question to, to answer. Chilling is important for, um, if you think about these fruit buds, they started being initiated back in the fall, but they have to have enough chilling hours before they are differentiated or developed into a, into a fruit bud in the spring. And we need a certain number of chilling to accomplish that. So if we, if we have a lot of chilling, we'll have a lot of fruit buds. And this is also for pecans as well. And so sometimes our, our lateral shoots are, need uh, more chilling hours. And so on a high chill year, we may have more laterals push because they've had extra chilling. The, the terminal buds, um, normally if we have flowers on the end, those will need less chilling and they will push uh, sooner. So we'll have flowering usually at the end before we'll have the lateral buds push. Now, if we don't have enough chilling hours, in many states like uh, Southern Texas, uh, down in the Florida along the coastline, they don't get enough chilling hours to satisfy the needs of things like apples and pears and cherries that need a thousand or more hours of chilling normally. So they have to look at, at trees that will bloom and start the growth properly in the spring using less chilling hours. So we have some peaches if they have like Texas Star or Florida or Gulf in the name of that tree, it's probably considered a low chill variety. So they are gonna be best suited for those areas with low chilling. But things that we recommend are gonna have those higher chilling requirements, like 800 to 1,000 hours for Oklahoma. Now, if like this season, there are some areas in the southern part of the state that have had less than 300 hours of chilling. And the thing about chilling hours is if we get above 60 degrees, we start losing those accumulated hours. So we can end up with zero hours if we uh, get too warm in the wintertime. And so this is probably the, the least amount of chilling hours that I have seen in any, any season that, that I've been working with fruit trees. Less than 300 is very, very low. And so on peaches and other stone fruits, they are self-pollinated. So if you end up with blossoms, that um, you may still have fruit. But if we're looking at things like apples and pears, we may miss our pollination window if we don't have enough chilling hours for some of the trees. We've got this apple that is, is starting to bloom. You've got uh, some flowers right here. And then this one on this side is supposed to be the pollinator. And it's just now starting to push out uh, a few buds right now. So it's behind quite a bit. So if we need pollen from this tree to, for the bees to move to this tree, we're gonna miss that window of opportunity to provide the pollen source for this tree. And likewise, when this tree starts to bloom, this tree will probably be finished and we won't have a pollen source for this tree. So we may end up with lots of pretty flowers, but no fruit just due to the, the window of opportunity of, of that pollination not happening because our, our flowering is off this year due to the low chilling hours. 
Now in Stillwater, we've got uh, about the first part of March, uh, when we think of our chilling hours for like apricots and those early blooming trees like apricots and plums and, and almonds, maybe peaches, um, we were about 500 chilling hours for the central part of the state. And since then we've accumulated, accumulated a little more, but a lot of my early blooming trees like apricots and almonds, they're just now blooming, which is very, very late. And so they require less chilling most of the time, but um, they just haven't bloomed like they normally would. And most of the time our, our peach trees, they're gonna be blooming in the central part of the state about March 15th to the 20th. And so this year um, it's been very late. So we'll see how it goes, but for right now, that may be one reason that we have less fruit production this, this season. Today we are here at the Cimarron Valley Research Station in their fruit orchard. And we are joined by Becky Carroll, who is our fruit tree extension specialist. Becky, I know a lot of times this time of year, people are looking to add fruit trees into their backyard. Tell us a little bit about some advice you might give that first time grower. Well, the most important thing is make sure that you're buying something that is adapted for your area. So Oklahoma is not California or Washington. So we have very fluctuating temperatures. And so we want something that's gonna be adapted to our climate and the amount of disease pressure that we might have. So that's really important things to consider when you're looking for a fruit tree. Now I know a lot of times that's the big thing is when is the last frost gonna happen? Mm -hmm. And that can be detrimental to those fruit being set. Right, we wanna make sure that the trees that we're ordering are gonna be adapted to our, our climate. And one way we can kind of look at that is the number of chill hours that are required for that tree to start to grow in the spring and produce fruit. Okay. And so a chill- You're Talking about the winter hours, yeah, right? The cold temperatures. And it has to be between 32 degrees and 45 to 50. There's a couple of different models. But the number of hours after they go dormant kind of um, we accumulate those hours when they're between that, zero, that 32 and 45 and those numbers we accumulate to see how many chill hours these trees might need. And in Oklahoma we range from about 800 chill hours that we normally get in the southern part to maybe 1,000 or 1,200 hours in the northern part of the state. And then some of these trees are going to be uh, low chill varieties or, or higher chill varieties. And you think of things like apples and pears and cherries that are grown in the northern states that do really well up north. They usually have a higher chill hour re requirement. So they need more cold temperature need, in order to set that fruit. Right, and if it can't be too cold because that doesn't count. It has to be above 32. Okay. Now if we get above 60, it starts to take away some of those hours. It actually subtracts. Yes, it, <laughs> it will take away our chilling. So if we ended up with a really warm February, we might lose some of that accumulation that we had gotten earlier. Okay. So it kind of can get complicated if yeah. you're trying to buy fruit trees, but I know some companies make it a little bit more simple. Oh yeah. By just enter your zip code and we'll recommend certain varieties sure. for you. And it's also by zone. Okay. And so most of Oklahoma is going to be in zone six and seven. Mm -hmm. And so just know where you are in the state and then find those trees that are going to fit. But like you said, some, you just put your zip code in, they say, these are the trees that are going to work for you. Are there any that you probably should avoid? Like if it says Texas or Florida, yep. should we avoid some of those Southern states? Those have Northern? been bred to do well in those areas without a lot of chilling. Okay. And so if you see something that says Texas star or Gulf something or Florida sweet, those are probably gonna be low chill varieties. When we plant those here in Perkins, in the central part of the state, they may meet, meet all their chilling requirements before February, get a couple of nice warm days and they start to bloom or even leaf out and so which means yeah if we have another freeze that comes through you've lost your crop right and sometimes you can even have tree damage because if they're um, 
actively growing, you can have wood damage to those trees as well. Okay. So it's best to stay away from those. And that, that's applicable to all of most of your fruit trees? Most fruit trees are going to have a different amount of chilling needed. Okay. So things like figs and pomegranates, they just need to lose their leaves and they're ready to start growing okay. again. And so that's why a lot of the time our figs die back to the ground every year because they don't actually ever stop growing. Uh, they, they just start accumulating those hours and start, when we get warm, they start growing again. Mm -hmm. And so if they're actively growing and we get temperatures that are below about 17, they're gonna die back to the ground. So what about that backyard gardener who might live in an urban space that you know is very limited on space available for a fruit tree? Well, they might consider something, well, they need to be careful because if they're planting things like pears or apples, some cherries, um, and plums even, they may need two trees for cross-pollination. Now, it just doesn't mean you can plant two golden delicious and have pollination. You have to have two complementary varieties that flower at the same time. Okay. And so, most of the time, the catalogs give you a good idea of what is going to uh, pollinate each other. So okay. they give you some help there. So if you have limited space, you might consider growing something that's a columnar type of apple, has short spur growth instead of long shoots. And so it stays more upright and, and not, it doesn't spread out very much. Or you might look at a dwarf apple tree. These are uh, some of our, our the, the dwarf types. We have some semi-dwarf, but you can keep them at a size that's manageable with your pruning. Okay. And so it, it is important to make sure that you know the pollination requirements, especially for those pears, apples, cherries, plums. Most of our peaches, nectarines, and things are going to be self-pollinating. Peaches and nectarines are going to be more difficult to manage the insect and diseases. Okay. They have a lot of issues and have to be sprayed pretty much from bloom time until harvest. And that can be organic spray too. It can be but... organic spray, but it has to have some type of insect and disease control from, we start disease control on peaches at bloom time and then introduce our insecticides at petal fall. So we're avoiding spraying those, those pollinators. Okay. But it has to be continued every 10 to 14 days until harvest. So it's a big uh, investment of time. Yeah, okay. Well, what about sourcing these um, trees? I and mean, what size should we be looking for? Because I know they sure. vary from anywhere from a whip that you get in a box or a little sack right. to something that's already over our heads and in a container. Well, I like to invest in those smaller trees if possible. And I like to order my fruit trees from a nursery that specializes in fruit tree production. They're gonna have the best quality, they're gonna have the best varieties, and know what they're selling you. So mm -hmm. they can provide you some assistance in what's gonna work best as well. But if you buy a large peach tree, and I've seen some that may be 10 feet tall, and you bring it home to plant in your yard, I'm gonna recommend that you cut it off at knee high. Mm -hmm. And so it may be $100 worth of tree, but you're gonna cut it back to knee high. So that's very difficult for you as the homeowner to do that pruning. But if you don't get the structure set, especially for peaches and a lot of those prunus types, you're never gonna have enough sunlight or airflow through those trees to help with the disease problems. And not only are you losing a lot of your investment that you just yeah. paid for, but also it's usually a larger diameter yep. that you're cutting versus some of those smaller whips. Yeah, that... if we, if I can, I will order about a 24 inch whip tree, plant that, especially for peaches, and it will catch a larger tree in year three when it starts producing. Right. So they have better adaptability, better transplanting, um, and it's just gonna be easier on your pocketbook and your, uh, your heart when you have to do that <laughs> pruning to it as well. Well, I know this is kind of the time that people are starting to order, so um, what, how, what do you do once we get those in? I like to have my trees delivered about the time that I'm ready to plant. And I like to plant about mid-February to early March. And so I got in a box of trees just the other day and I'm not really ready to plant just yet. Now, if you get them in early and you're ready to plant, go ahead. But if you're not ready to plant, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a way to kind of tie them over until you're ready to get them in the ground. All right, let's go take a look. Okay. So I've got the order uh, box that I received last week. And so whenever you get them in before you're ready, you wanna make sure you open them up, make sure there's enough moisture in there because if they're too dry, you're gonna have trouble with, um, with their survival. Mm -hmm. 
And so make sure they're moist. A lot of them will come in with peat moss or newspaper shavings or something. And so I'll leave all of that on right now because we're going to heal them in. H-E-E-L. Right. Heal in. So, so it's we're not just planting. Not planting. We're just going to store them until we're ready to plant. Okay. And so what we've done, and this had plastic, so we removed that. But if it's got other material, the newspaper mulch, just leave that on there. It'll be fine. Okay. Now this is just protecting the roots from uh, freezing or drying out. And so we're gonna lay them in this little ditch that we've already uh, prepared. So it's kind of a flat surface and then it levels out. And we're gonna protect the roots the most. So we'll use this uh, mulch pile that we've got here with some soil in it. And just cover them up. Just right? cover the roots okay. well. And then make sure that it is um, wet. Right now we're kind of in a drought, so we want to make sure that we keep this moist while we're keeping them healed in. And if the uh, trees actually came in a little bit dry, would you want to soak those? Before? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Soak them for a few hours before they are placed in the, in the hole here. And that's, that goes for before you plant as well. You right. would want to make sure that they are, um, have a lot of moisture. And now, how far up do you go? Just where the Well, you can cover the rest of it with mulch if you'd like, but the most important thing is just make sure that it's tight with no air pockets in here so it protects those those roots. I mean, I, it looks pretty rough. <laughs> I know, you're just stepping on it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really um, not going to hurt them. And the, the more soil mulch um, that we're covering them with, the more protection it's going to provide. Now, we really want these to stay dormant until we plant them. And so that's um, another reason we could cover them completely over. Okay, so basically we're just laying them down. They're not gonna start rooting in here or anything like now, that. Now, if you leave them, they will. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but we want to just keep them here until we're ready to plant, which is gonna be in just a couple of weeks. Okay, so it just buys us a little time yep. until we have that perfect mm -hmm. spot figured out. Yep. All right, well, thank you, Becky, for this little introduction into sure. backyard fruit trees. Um, and I know there's a lot more to be known about this, so we will catch up with you again later. All right, thank you. Today we are just outside of Fort Gibson at Greenleaves Hidden Lake Nursery. And joining me today is Mark Andrews. Mark, a lot of people are eating those delicious peaches this time of year, but you're working on the future crop of peaches, right. right? Right. So these crops that we're working on are for next year and future years beyond that. Okay, so we've got tiny little peach trees growing here, but these right. aren't what's going to be the finished product, right? No, this is just, these are young peach seedlings that are here in the field. And what we're going to do is use these to bud the improved varieties that everybody's looking for at the grocery store. So if they're looking for a Hale Haven peach or a Red Haven peach, whatever variety it is, that's what we bud onto these so that we know we've got a good consistent crop and that it's true to the name of the, of the peach. So what we do is we collect wood from known trees. Okay. So we go to orchards where we already know what the tree is and we collect wood from that particular variety. And then what we do is we take small little buds and we go ahead and graft those onto these seedlings. And then after the bud goes ahead and heals onto that tree and everything, then we break the seedling tree off and put all the energy into that bud and start a whole new tree okay. so that is true to the name of the variety. With peaches, they're fairly rapidly growing plants. So what we'll be doing is we'll be grafting them right now at this time of year mm -hmm. uh, in you know early summer and in about four to five weeks is when we'll come back and we'll start bending these tops of these trees over okay. because by then they'll be healed onto there and we want to start pushing the growth into that bud and start the new tree. Okay. Why do you bend them over instead of just cutting the tops off? It seems to work better to bend it over there's still a little bit of energy that comes from the leaves and everything like that to feed the plant and everything. And, but by breaking it over, you're disrupting the, uh, the growing tissue, the, the xylem that transmits the nutrients and water. 
So we're stopping that from going up into the rest of it. It's all going to the bud. Okay. But there's still enough leaves to kind of support the plant right. and keep it going. Okay. All right. So you've got next year's crop growing over next to us also. Mm -hmm. right. So those are the ones that have that scion wood already growing out, Correct. right? So are those ready to sell yet or where are we those at Those trees, for the way that Greenleaf Nursery operates, is those trees will be dug this winter. Mm -hmm. And then we will put them into containers and grow them for one more growing season. And then we will sell them. Okay. To the end consumers. All right. So we've got. So we're still two years away, even with what we've got here. And and these are a year old, right? You grew these as seedlings. These seedlings so, are a year old. So yes. you've got what now? Four years invested in that Correct. peach tree before it gets to the Correct. nursery, really? Yes. So yep. that that's what we can soon see at next year's nurseries. Is correct. That correct? All that's right. right. Thank you, Mark, so much mm -hmm. for sharing this with us. You're welcome. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Join us next week on Oklahoma Gardening as we walk through all the home lawn concerns. garden and today I wanted to talk to you about something that you might To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Tulsa Garden Center at Woodward Park, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, Smart Pot, and the Tulsa Garden Club. Thank you.